Welcome to the CJD Foundation Virtual Conference and today's session, Fundamental Prion Disease Research, Progress and Challenges on the Road to Therapeutics. We thank our partners, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center for helping make the CJD Foundation Virtual Conference possible. We also thank all who have donated to the CJD Foundation or through Strides for CJD. Your gifts help support all of the Foundation's programs, medical education, family support, research grants, and conference presentations like the one you'll see today. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Joel Watts, who conducts prion research at University of Toronto. Please enter your questions as they occur to you during the presentation. At the conclusion of the session, we'll address as many of the questions as time permits, focusing on today's topics. Following this presentation and its Q&A session will be a special program for families only called Moving Roundtables. This is a wonderful opportunity to speak in small groups with experts in prion disease. If you registered for moving roundtables, you will have a separate login. If you did not register or did not receive the login, please email us within the next half hour at help at cjdfoundation.org. If your family was affected by CJD, we can register you today and add you to the moving roundtables program. Welcome to the CJD Foundation. 2022 virtual conference, Dr. Pierre uh, Luigi Gambetti keynote address by Dr. Joel Watts. It's my great pleasure to present Dr. Joel Watts, who in addition to being a world renowned prion disease researcher, was also unfortunately a family member affected by this disease. Dr. Watts obtained his bachelor's of science in biochemistry from the University of Washington on Western Ontario in 2003. He completed his PhD in the lab of Dr. David Westerway, the University of Toronto, and then did his postdoc studies underneath the Nobel laureate, Dr. Stanley Prusner at UCSF. Since moving back to the University of Toronto, he runs his own lab now focused on prion disease and other protein misfolding disorders, including a beta implicated in Alzheimer's disease and alpha synuclein uh, implicated in Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. He's known for his innovative approaches to developing models to study prion disease and others, including looking at bank folds, uh, which is a somewhat of a universal substrate for prion disease, as well as straining of not only prion diseases, but other protein misfolding disorders. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joel Watts. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming to my talk as part of the 2022 CJD Foundation Family Conference and thanks to Dr. Appleby for the kind introduction. My lab at the University of Toronto focuses on trying to understand the role of protein misfolding and aggregation in the prion diseases, as well as related neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. It really is my distinct pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to thank Debbie Yobbs and the CJD Foundation for giving me the opportunity to give my thoughts on a topic that's very close to my heart, both uh, scientifically and personally. The title I settled on for my talk is Fundamental Prion Disease Research, Progress and Challenges on the Road to Therapeutics. However, I had a really hard time choosing between that title and the title shown on this slide. Today, I will be talking about some of the important scientific advances within the prion field that have been made in recent years. I'm going to focus on those that have direct relevance to the development of therapies for prion disease as this remains of the utmost importance, given that there are still no treatments available for any of the human prion diseases. Of course, since nobody wants to listen to me drag on ad infinitum, and believe me, I could talk about prions for hours, I've had to select a few topics that I feel are fundamentally important and or interesting. I apologize in advance to my colleagues whose amazing work I do not have time to mention today, as I'm a firm believer that all research on prion disease is important and provides a piece of a larger puzzle. Before I get into some of the latest research, I thought I'd give a very brief introduction to prions and prion diseases. Prion diseases affect both humans and animals. 
Arguably the most famous prion disease is bovine spongiform encephalopathy, more commonly known as mad cow disease. Other prion diseases of animals include scrapie, which affects sheep, and chronic wasting disease, which affects cervids such as deer, elk, and moose. The human prion diseases illustrate an interesting fact. Prion diseases are the only type of disease that can manifest in three completely different ways. Either sporadically, as occurs in sporadic CJD, genetically, as occurs with fatal familial insomnia, GSS, or familial CJD, or via an, an infection, as occurs with variant CJD, iatrogenic CJD, and Kuru. Before moving on, I'd like to state what a privilege it is to be giving this talk today in honor of Dr. Pierluigi Gambetti, the former medical director of the CJD Foundation. Dr. Gambetti has made so many important contributions to the prion field during his distinguished career, but his work on fatal familial insomnia and developing methods for classifying the different types of human prion diseases have had a profound impact on how we think about these diseases. Prion diseases are essentially a disease of protein structure. So what exactly is a prion? Prions are made up of a single protein called the prion protein or PRP. The normal version of the prion protein is called PRPC. I find it helpful to think of PRPC as a Chevrolet Corvette. PRPC, like most proteins, is a dynamic entity. It can undergo subtle changes in its structure, such as the opening of the door, raising the hood, or putting its roof down. However, in the grand scheme of things, these are minor structural changes. You can still tell that it's a car. During prion disease, PRPC gets converted to a completely different structure called PRPSC, or PRP scrapie. PRPSC exhibits markedly different structural and physical properties, whereas PRPC is benign. PRPSC is a dangerous molecule that is toxic to brain cells. Here's a slightly more scientific version of the same slide. This is basically prion disease in a nutshell. PRPC changes its shape into the abnormal form called PRPSC. Once PRPSC is generated, it immediately clumps together to form aggregates with other PRPSC molecules, which deposit in the brain and ultimately cause disease. PRPSC is what's called a self-propagating or self-multiplying protein. It can essentially catalyze its own formation. When PRPSC encounters a molecule of PRPC, it causes PRPC to convert into an additional copy of PRPSC. This allows PRPC to, or PRPSC to amplify exponentially and then spread throughout the brain. It is also the basis for the infectious prion diseases. When a pre-existing source of prions is introduced into the body, the PRPSC can convert host PRPC into new PRPSC, which initiates the disease process. Unlike other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and ALS, each of which involve complex interactions between several genes, proteins, and brain processes, prion disease is relatively simple in its etiology. As far as we know, a single protein, a prion protein, is the major factor responsible for the disease process. This is both good and bad. The good news is that we know which protein to target if we want to combat prion disease. The bad news is that PRP can be difficult to target. As shown in this slide, there are several potential ways one might think about uh, trying to uh, treat prion disease. And for the remainder of my presentation, I'm going to talk about how advances in our understanding of the fundamental biology of prions are helping to pave the way for the development of therapies for CJD and the other human prion disorders. Arguably the best therapeutic strategy, at least in theory, for combating prion disease is to reduce or eliminate the production of PRPC in the brain. This is akin to shutting off the tap for prion production. If you have no PRPC, you can't make any prions. The appeal of this strategy is that it would be predicted to work against all the different types of prions, also called prion strains. For instance, blocking the production of human PRPC should work equally well for CJD, FFI, and GSS. We know that preventing PRPC from being made will work, since pioneering work by Charles Weissman showed that 
genetically engineered mice that are unable to produce PRBC, so-called PRB knockout mice, are completely resistant to prion disease. Now, obviously the situation in humans is much more challenging. One cannot simply genetically engineer humans to become resistant to prion disease by getting rid of their prion gene. However, the technology now exists to reduce the production of specific genes or proteins in our cells. A quick reminder of the central dogma of molecular biology. DNA, i.e. our genes, gets transcribed to produce messenger RNA, which in turn then gets translated into proteins that perform the bulk of functions in our cells. Molecules called antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs for short, have been developed that seek out the messenger RNA of a specific gene, bind to it, and prevent it from being translated into protein. The end result is that ASOs directed against a specific gene reduce the amount of the corresponding protein that gets produced. For prion disease, ASOs targeted to the prion gene ultimately result in less PRPC being produced in the brain. Theoretically, this should block or at least slow prion production. Eric Minikel and Sonia Vallab have recently shown that injecting mice with an ASO that targets the prion gene results in a significant extension in survival following prion infection. Importantly, therapeutic benefit was reserved across all the different types of mouse prions tested. These results are really encouraging, and I know that ASOs against the human prion gene are being designed for eventual testing against human prions. I am extremely hopeful that ASOs will eventually be developed into a therapy for treating human prion disease. However, a fundamental question arises with this type of therapeutic strategy. Is reducing or even possibly eliminating PRPC in the brain safe? i.e. could a reduction of PRPC levels within the brain actually have some deleterious consequences? So why do we produce PRPC in our brains to begin with? Most proteins either play a structural or a functional role in a cell. What exactly is the quote unquote normal function of PRPC? As Adriano Aguzzi elegantly, elegantly stated in 2004, it seems unlikely that a singular protein that is as highly conserved among species as PRPC, from turtles to frogs, fish, and humans, has evolved for the sole reason of bestowing susceptibility to prion disease. Aside from pure scientific curiosity, why is it important to understand the normal role PRPC plays in a cell? Well, it remains possible that the normal function of PRPC might somehow be subverted during prion disease potentially contributing to disease pathogenesis. More importantly, since lowering PRPC levels is such an attractive therapeutic strategy for prion disease, it would be nice to know what the potential side effects might be. The most common way of ascertaining the function of a protein is to get rid of it and see what goes wrong. As I mentioned a few slides ago, PRP knockout mice, which don't produce any PRPC, were integral in proving that PRPC is required for prion disease. Aside from being resistant to prion disease, are there any notable physiological deficits in PRP knockout mice? The short answer is no. The mice are essentially indistinguishable from normal, my, uh, normal mice by most measures. They breed normally. They have an intact immune system. They develop properly. properly. They have the same lifespans as normal mice and they don't appear to have any major behavioral abnormalities. Thus, one might conclude that, at least in mice, PRPC is not essential. The mice seem to live perfectly happily without it. However, upon more careful examination, Adriano Guzzi and colleagues discovered that as these PRP knockout mice age, they start to lose the myelin sheaths that surround the axons of neurons in the peripheral nervous system. The myelin sheath is a sort of insulation for brain cells. Much like the insulation present in electrical wires, myelin helps to ensure that nerve impulses are transmitted properly. Thus, PRPC seems to be necessary for the maintenance of peripheral nerve myelination. This is quite a robust observation as goats lacking PRPC also display this abnormality. However, this is a fairly mild deficit and it remains unclear where the, whether this is the 
sole or major function that PRPC playing, plays in the brain. What happens when you get rid of PRPC in other species? Fish produce two different versions of PRPC called PRP1 and PRP2. Ted Allison's group at the University of Alberta has shown that getting rid of PRP1, PRP2, or both of them at the same time, does not result in any overt changes in the zebrafish, uh, again suggesting that PRPC is dispensable under normal conditions. Furthermore, Jurgen Richt and colleagues produced cows that lack PRPC, not because they were interested in determining the function of PRPC, but because they wanted to generate animals that are resistant to mad cow disease. Apparently, these PRPC knockout cows are perfectly normal, providing further evidence that removing PRPC in a larger animal is also relatively benign. What about in humans? Because at the end of the day, this is what matters most when thinking about lowering PRPC levels to treat human prion disease. In recent years, it has become relatively routine to sequence every single protein coding gene, or even the entire genome, of an individual. When the genomes of many people are compared, rare sequence variations in genes become apparent. Eric Minical uh, examined the sequence of the PRP gene from tens of thousands of healthy individuals and identified rare variations predicted to result in a partial knockout of PRPC. Because we all have two copies of our prion gene, one inherited from your mother and one from your father, Individuals with these variants are expected to have only one normal copy of the prion gene and therefore produce half the normal amount of PRPC in their brains. Encouragingly, these individuals seem perfectly healthy, revealing that a 50% reduction in PRPC levels in humans is tolerated. So even if we don't yet completely understand what PRPC does in the brain, the most important point is that lowering PRPC levels as a therapeutic strategy for prion disease is likely to be safe. An alternative strategy for blocking production of prions would be to prevent the conversion of PRPC into PRPSC. One of the most fascinating recent discoveries in the prion field comes from John Collins, Simon Mead, and colleagues in the United Kingdom. They found a novel prion gene variation called G127V in individuals seemingly resistant to Kuru, i.e. they never developed Kuru despite there being a high chance that they were exposed at some point to Kuru prions. When genetically engineered mice were produced that contained this prion gene variant, they were found to be completely resistant to prion disease. Amazingly, this variant also blocked the conversion of the normal prion gene into prions and was essentially as good at preventing prion disease as was removing the prion gene itself. While exploiting this observation for therapeutic purposes in humans may not be straightforward, advances in gene editing that I'll talk about later may make it possible to generate prion resistant cells within our bodies. Importantly, because this variant is unlikely to interfere with the normal function of PRPC, whatever that is, it would alleviate some of the concerns surrounding lowering PRPC levels in the brain. Returning to the schematic of prion disease, another therapeutic strategy would be to design molecules that bind to BRPC to prevent its conversion into PRPSC, or to identify molecules capable of binding to PRPSC that lead to its clearance or prevent its toxicity. These endeavors would be greatly aided by knowing the molecular structures of PRP, or PRPC and PRPSC. Individual proteins are far too small to be visualized using a conventional microscope. So their three-dimensional structures have to be determined using techniques such as uh, NMR spectroscopy or X-ray crystallography. Shown on the right of the slide is the structure of PRPC which was determined more than 25 years ago using NMR spectroscopy. While knowing the three-dimensional structure of PRPC has been useful, it has unfortunately not yet led to the discovery of a small molecule therapy for prion disease. In fact, Eric Minical and colleagues concluded in a recent study that PRPC is a difficult target for small molecular binders. 
Thus, knowing the three-dimensional structure of PRBSC may be more informative for therapeutic development. Solving the structure of PRPSC has been one of the most pressing yet challenging issues in prion disease research over the past 20 years. Because PRPSC clumps together to form large aggregates, traditional structural techniques don't work well with prions. My personal opinion is that determining the structure of PRPSC is one of the holy grails of prion research. Well, the wait is now over. The question of what is the airspeed velocity of an unladed, sw unladed swallow has been answered. And thanks to technological advances offered by the uh, technique called cryoelectron microscopy, structures of PRP SC have now been obtained. The structure of hamster PRP SC was determined last year by Allison Krauss and Byron Cove. On the left of the image is the structure of PRPC. On the right, is the structure of hamster PRPSC, both shown in green. You don't have to be an expert to appreciate that they are very different from each other. The model on the right shows what a large PRPSC aggregate might look like when sitting on the surface of a cell. The structure of hamster PRPSC was determined using prions extracted from the brain of prion-infected hamsters, and the structure is quite different than some of those solved using prion protein produced in bacteria or um, predicted using computer simulations. This highlights the importance of using authentic brain or cell-derived prions whenever possible when performing prion disease research. Within the last year, the structure of two types of mouse PRPSC have also been determined by Jonathan Wadsworth, John Collins, and colleagues in London. This is work that is not yet available in its final peer-reviewed published form, but was graciously posted online as a preprint to give researchers a sneak preview of the findings. Not surprisingly, the structures of mouse and hamster prions are quite similar, but different enough to provide an explanation for the unique biological properties. Moreover, the structures of the two types of mouse prions vary ever so slightly from each other, proving the long hypothesized theory that different prion strains arise due to structural variability in PRPSC aggregates. So is this the end of the story? Not quite. There are some questions about whether the extraction technique used to isolate prions from the brain may alter their structure. And it will be of critical importance to determine the structures of actual human prions from patient brains. However, neither of these points take away from the monumental achievement of determining the first high resolution structures of PRPSC. Returning to the prion disease schematic once more, I'd next like to focus specifically on the discovery of small molecules capable of inhibiting the accumulation of prions. The most, this is most commonly done using cultured mouse cells that are chronically infected with various types of mouse prions. Stan Prusner's lab conducted a screen of over 100,000 small molecules for their ability to reduce PRPSC levels in a mouse cell line infected with mouse prions. This led to the identification of two candidate anti-prion drugs called IND24 and IND81. While discovering drugs capable of interfering with prions in cultured cells is important, showing that they also interfere with the progression of prion disease in an intact animal is more important. When IND24 and IND81 were administered to mice following injection with prions, the drug-treated mice survived almost twice as long as the non-drug-treated mice. When coupled with the promising results in mice displayed by other small molecule antiprion compounds like AMLA-138B, compound B, and cellulose ethers, these studies provide proof of concept that it is possible to delay the onset of prion disease using a small molecule drug that is given orally. Yet there is clearly still work to be done since the mice despite surviving for longer, still eventually die of prion disease. As encouraging as the results from the IND24 studies in mice were, science can sometimes offer up sobering realities. When IND24 was tested in mice infected uh, with human CJD prions, there was no difference in survival between the non-treated and the drug-treated animals. Disappointingly, this result revealed that IND24 was unable to block the propagation of human prions, 
suggesting that it would be unlikely to be effective in patients if uh, with CJD. However, in a way, these results made sense. IND24 was discovered using mouse cells infected with mouse prions and was effective at treating mice infected with mouse prions. The solution seems simple. If you want to identify drugs that work against human prions, you need to identify them using human cells infected with human prions. This slide shows a list of all human cell lines that can become chronically infected with human prions. This is not a glitch in my presentation. There are exactly zero cell lines that have been shown capable of becoming infected with CJD or other types of human prions. This is not due to a lack of trying, as this has been a pressing need in the field for decades. And despite the considerable effort from prion labs across the world, stable propagation of human prions in immortalized cultured human cells has never been achieved. The scientific explanation for this frustrating observation remains somewhat of a mystery. It appears as if there is something fundamentally different about human prions compared to mouse prions. One hypothesis is that they replicate much slower than mouse prions. So in dividing cells, human prion replication may not outpace the diluting effects of cell division. In an ideal world, we would have an immortalized human cell line capable of replicating human prions. Immortalized cell lines are desirable because they can be kept in culture indefinitely, they're easy and cheap to work with, and they typically yield very reproducible results. In the absence of immortalized human cell lines, it might be possible to use cell lines that produce the bank full of prion protein. If you've ever heard any of my previous talks at the CJD Foundation conferences, you might remember that bank foals are an outlier in the prion field and that they can become infected with prions from many different species, including humans. In recent years, considerable progress have been, has been made towards replicating human prions in uh, using more advanced uh, cellular systems. Stefan Heitz group has shown that primary neurons cultured from the brains of mice genetically engineered to produce the human prion protein can become infected with various types of CJD prions. In a landmark study in 2017, Susanna Krejciova and colleagues showed that astrocytes derived from human stem cells can also become infected with various types of CJD prions. Theoretically, these systems could be used in drug screens to identify anti-prion compounds active against human prions. However, there may be some logistical challenges to overcome. Technology has advanced so much that it is now possible to grow many human brain-like organs in a tissue culture dish. To do this, patient cells, typically skin cells, are genetically reprogrammed so that they become stem cells capable of being turned into many different cell types, including blood cells, heart cells, and even brain cells. By adding specific factors to the stem cells and culturing them in a certain way, you can create clusters of cells that differentiate into major cell types present in the human brain, such as neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. These cells interact with each other to form ordered brain-like structures resulting in the generation of what are called human cerebral organoids, or mini-brains. Catherine Hayes lab at the NIH has shown that it is possible to infect cerebral organoids with CJD prions over a period of several months. Thus, going forward, cerebral organoids may be a useful tool for prion drug discovery efforts. A potential game-changing technology has come to the forefront of research within the last few years. I'm sure many of you have heard about CRISPR in the news. CRISPR evolved as an adaptive immune system to help bacteria defend themselves against viral infections. The CRISPR system has been repurposed to allow editing of genes in mammalian cells. One of its major uses is to generate knockouts of genes in cell lines. Since there are several mouse cell lines that are susceptible to mouse prions, the following question was asked. Do these mouse cell lines become susceptible to prions from other species if their prion protein gene is swapped out for that of the other species? This question has now been tackled by several labs and has revealed really exciting results. My lab used CRISPR uh, gene editing to knock out the mouse prion protein in CAD5 cells, a cell line that is susceptible to many different types of mouse prions. When we put back in the hamster prion gene, we found that these cells could become infected with several different types of hamster prions. Similarly, Herman Schatzel's group put back the bankful prion protein into these cells and found that they could now propagate CWD prions from deer or elk. 
Finally, Adriano Agutti's group took a human cell line called SHS by 5Y, knocked out the human prion protein gene using CRISPR, and then put back in the gene encoding the sheep prion protein, resulting in susceptibility to sheep scraping prions. This is a very important finding, as it reveals that the inability to replicate human prions in human cells is not because human cell lines are intrinsically resistant to prions. The last topic I'd like to cover today is a bit outside the box. The reality is that prion diseases are not made currently a major acute healthcare issue as they were back when the transmission of mad cow disease to humans first became apparent. Obtaining funding for prion research from major granting agencies is becoming increasingly challenging. This is why the fundraising and advocacy efforts of the CJD Foundation, as well as the families who provide donations to support the research grants offered by the foundation, are critical for enhancing research efforts in the prion field. Neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are predicted to have a significant impact on healthcare systems in the coming years due to an aging population. A theory has been put forward by Stan Prusner and others suggesting that the underlying biology in prion disease and other brain diseases such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and ALS are very similar. The idea is that proteins such as A beta and tau in Alzheimer's disease and alpha-synuclein and Parkinson's disease change their shape, self-assemble into aggregates, and then become self-multiplying, just like prions. In my opinion, there is a lot to be gained from studying Alzheimer's and Parkinson's using the mechanistic lens of prion disease. As one example, the RT-QUIT technique, which was originally developed uh, by Byron Coey's lab as a sensitive method for diagnosing prion disease, can now be used to differentiate Parkinson's disease from related illnesses. As another example, injection of genetically modified mice with human alpha synuclein aggregates causes the mice to develop a progressive neurological illness, almost perfectly reminiscent of the transmission of human prions to genetically engineered mice. Therefore, there are some striking similarities in the molecular mechanisms underlying prion disease and the other human neurodegenerative conditions. That is not to say that they are exactly the same, as it is clear that Parkinson's disease, ALS, and Alzheimer's cannot be readily transmitted from person to person or from animal to human as can sometimes occur with the prion diseases. However, I would argue that continued funding of research into the fundamental biology of prions will not only provide new insight into the prion diseases, but is also likely to yield results that are helpful for understanding disease pathogenesis, pathogenesis in more common disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Although the field has made substantial progress in understanding the fundamental science of prions, there is still lots of work to be done. Mysteries that remain unsolved include why are proteins toxic to brain cells? Why do prions form spontaneously in the brain? Are there any other proteins or molecules that play important roles in prion formation or replication? Large-scale genetic studies on individuals with CJD done by Simon Mead and colleagues suggest that there might be other genes that contribute to CJD pathogenesis. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, several questions specific to human prions remain to be answered, including why are they so hard to replicate in cultured cells, and what do their structures last, uh, look like? I'd like to leave everyone with a sense, of, a sense of infectious optimism. Advances in technology are constantly furthering our knowledge of the fundamental biology of prion disease, as well as facilitating the discovery of disease-modifying therapeutics. I mentioned earlier that CRISPR gene editing can be used to knock out genes in cells. It can also be used to correct mutations in genes. In the future, it might be possible to correct mutations in the prion gene in individuals at risk for developing genetic CJD, GSS, or FFI. The technology to do this will almost certainly work. The challenge will be finding a way to deliver the CRISPR machinery into sufficient numbers of brain cells for it to be effective. Related to CRISPR, it is now possible to interrogate the function of every single gene in the human genome by either increasing or, increasing or decreasing each gene's uh, production one by one. This will allow us to identify genes and proteins involved in prion infection, replication, and toxicity with incredible precision. Finally, the advent of single cell sequencing techniques will allow prion pathogenesis to be probed at single cell resolution potentially identifying specific subtypes of brain cells that are the most relevant to prion disease. It suffices to say that I am very excited about what the next five to 10 years of prion research will review. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention and I would be happy to answer any questions. 
Uh, one of the nice things about being in this field is it's small and uh, it's seemingly everyone in this field is extremely nice to work with and extremely collegial. And I think you saw that in Dr. Watt's presentation. And uh, I think you also noticed during this virtual conference that much of our talks are moving more and more towards therapeutics compared to what we've seen in the past. And that's also encouraging. Um, Joel, I just wanted to ask you a couple questions uh, related to your talk. One is you talked about um, the normal prion protein, PRPC, and we don't know exactly what its function is. You mentioned that it could be involved in, in myelin maintenance, that wrapping around um, the nerve cell, but are there other potential functions of PRPC that people have found? Yes, there, there, there are. Um, and the challenge has been that uh, each lab sort of comes up with their own finding and it's been hard to sort of find agreement between labs as to, to what's true and what's not. But I'll, I'll go over some of the, um, the other hypotheses that have been put forward to what PRPC may be doing normally in the brain. Um, it has been suggested that it might be involved in the regulation of circadian rhythms. It's been suggested that it might be involved in allowing us to smell things properly. Um, one of the more recent suggestions is that uh, it plays a role in a biological process called the um, epithel epithelial mesenchymal transition. Um, and something that's been um, observed quite often is that it seems that PRPC, although the details aren't really well understood, that it plays some sort of beneficial protective function. And so in general, PRPC, having it there can protect against certain types of insults to the brain, like um, um, an injury called by, injury caused by a stroke, say, or um, expression of a, a different toxic protein. It seems that PRPC can, can partially block the bad things from going on, even if we don't know exactly what is happening at, at the uh, molecular level. And interestingly, um, it seems that PRPC, and this is probably not its normal function, but maybe somehow related to it, that it also seems to be involved in potentially other diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's by acting as sort of a, a receptor on the cell surface for the, some of the toxic proteins that are involved in these other diseases and potentially somehow transducing into the cell a, a signal of toxicity that um, is involved in the disease process. And so um, maybe somehow uh, the PRPC function is also related to uh, that, although in a, in a sort of a more of a positive situation than a negative situation. Earlier in your talk, Joel, you talked about how conversion of the normal prion protein to the disease causing form of the prion um, and its seeding occurs and proliferates exponentially. So why is it that within prion diseases itself, you actually see different levels of prion protein deposition, but also different durations of prion disease that can be quite drastic. For example, a couple months to several years. Um, there, there are several possible explanations. Um, one of the, um, the simplest is the uh, idea that um, not all prions are alike and that uh, you can have different strains of, of prions. And so um, the idea of, of, of strains, I'm sure will be familiar to many in the, um, in the audience. So you can have different strains of bacteria and different strains of viruses that are caused by changes in the, the, um, the agent's um, DNA. Uh, with, with prions, uh, different strains arise due to having slightly different shapes of the prions or PRPSC. And it, it's thought that the different shapes of PRPSC or these prion strains um, can do things like uh, propagate at different rates, uh, which would be dependent on say, how, how stable are they? How easy is it for the brain to clear these? So ones that are more stable, um, maybe uh, they don't spread as well because it's harder for them to get broken down into smaller pieces that can then spread. Or it could be uh, related to different strains, um, preferentially um, targeting different brain regions. And we don't know why this occurs, but there are certainly um, different prion strains that um, are more found in, say, the, the thalamus, as occurs in, um, uh, in, in fatal familial insomnia, and this is part of a, a, the brain that's important for, for sleep, and um, where other, other prion strains, like many of the ones that cause sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, are preferentially uh, um, found in areas of the brain involved in things like uh, uh, memory fo formation and cognition, which is why you can get a more of a dementia sort of presentation of the diseases. And so, um, the idea of prion strains is still a very complex process um, and is still not fully understood as to um, why you get these differences. 
Joel, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that prion disease is unique and that there's three causes. There's the acquired forms, whether it be through mad cow disease or medical procedures, which are rare, about 1%, followed by genetic forms due to a genetic mutation, that's about 10%. <clears throat> but the vast majority of prion diseases are what we call sporadic. About 85% of them just happen. And <clears throat> excuse me, last year, Dr. Gambetti and I talked a little bit about what might be at the basis of sporadic disease. What are your thoughts about what causes sporadic prion disease? And so um, I'll give you um, two potential hypotheses, and these are, are, are my own. Um, the first is that... Um, we know that prion disease occurs much more um, frequently in people as they get older. And though this suggests that there's some sort of age-related um, uh, process uh, that's uh, related to the disease. And so what potentially might happen is that say in all of our cells, um, in even normal people, that every time, every day, right now, you probably have some small, tiny amount of PRP SC being formed. But the cell recognizes that this is wrong and it's bad and it gets rid of it before it causes problems. As you get older, um, it's likely that some of those quality control systems in your, in your brain don't work as well. And therefore it might be more likely that enough sort of rare events might happen in the same time in the same space to form uh, sort of a critical seed of prions that are then able to sort of take off and propagate uh, through the brain. Now, as to what exactly causes these sort of initial rare misfolding events, that's still anybody's guess. One theory could be that um, there could be sort of rare genetic changes in, in single cells in the brain that um, enhance the production of prions, and maybe uh, these might be the first cells to die in prion disease. And so by the time prion disease had, has completed, they wouldn't exist anymore. And therefore, these changes might be impossible to find or very, very challenging. And so I think the sort of the earliest events that are happening in sporadic prion disease remain one of those great mysteries. And um, I'm hopeful that through the generation of better cellular and animal models that we'll be able to get at these questions a lot better than we have been able to in the past. And hopefully we can identify why do prions form spontaneously and potentially what other sorts of um, um, you know, exposures or factors might influence the generation of prions in the brain. One of the other topics you mentioned during your talk is you presented the excellent work on the structure of the abnormal prion protein by Allison Krauss and others. Uh, could you take family members and people that are not too familiar with basic science, um, why it's so important to understand the, understand the structure of these molecules when we're talking about developing treatments? So it's... I think of it as like a lock and key sort of a situation. If you have, uh, if you need to unlock a certain lock, you have to have the right key that fits in specifically to that lock. Same sort of thing could be happening or, or could be the case if you wanted to develop or design a, a small molecule, a drug molecule that would be specifically bind to PRPSC and then cause it to say be uh, degraded or, or cleared or, or, or um, blocking its toxicity. And so if you know what the, the shape of PRPSC is, then you can sort of use a computer to rationally design molecules that would be predicted to fit into those, those shapes and bind tightly to the protein. And similarly, if you also know the, the shape or structure of PRPSC, it might be possible to, uh, when you compare it to the structure of PRPC, design antibodies that are specifically recognizing only the bad form, PRPSC. And I mean, this has been something that people have been trying to do and has been met with partial success. But now that we know the structures, we know the regions that are truly different and we might be able to um, sort of better design antibodies that are specific to um, uh, the PRPSC and could lead to, uh, to prion clearance or blocking of prion replication in the brain. Well, Joel, I think this ends our Q&A period, but I just want to say you're an excellent researcher, an excellent colleague, and you have a gift of explaining these concepts that can be quite uh, complicated in a way that's easily understandable to uh, family members and even to us clinicians. So uh, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to not only do this, but the moving roundtable. Um, any concluding remarks? 
Nope, I just want to say thanks to everybody for listening and uh, thanks to Brian for the introduction and to the CJD Foundation for their amazing efforts in um, helping families affected by these diseases and um, for promoting research into these diseases. And I think we all agree, as you say, we have a very collegial field and uh, I have never been more optimistic that we are eventually going to get where we want to be in terms of the development of, of therapies. Thank you.